Welcome, welcome, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Dave Peaty, and I'm the current board president of Publishing Professionals Network. Uh, we are really excited about uh, today's session. And um, uh, but before we start, I do want to uh, tell you about a couple of um, things that Publishing Professionals Network is going to be doing uh, coming up soon. Uh, so the uh, first thing I want to tell you is that every month on the third Thursday, roughly, we have an online Zoom um, meeting for those folks uh, who can't meet in person. We're starting to meet in person once again uh, here locally in the Bay Area, and you can find out about those by being on our mailing list. Um, then the other thing that I wanted to say is, in addition to this professional development session, uh, we try to have them about once a month in August that we'll be having a session uh, having to do with uh, paper sourcing and sustainability in book manufacturing. Uh, and then the um, other thing that I wanted to tell you about is that uh, we just closed the submissions process for um, uh, the book show that happens in October. It'll be at Chronicle Books in San Francisco. Um, and we're very excited about that. And then the following April in 2024, we're going to have our annual uh, conference, uh, uh, all-day conference Friday. I believe it's April 21st. I'll have to look it up, but you can look it up on our uh, 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 website, which is, we'll put a link to that in the chat. So I'm not going to go on with too much more. I do want to say that, one, if you're not a member, of PPN. I hope you'll consider joining after today. Um, it's a very uh, low uh, rate, especially for individuals, $25 a year. Um, and if that's a, a problem for you, then uh, please reach out to us. And then the um, other thing that I want to uh, uh, say is that if you're interested in volunteering, uh, please reach out to us for things like these professional development sessions, for the conference, for the book show, and anything else that we're doing. The last thing I'm going to say is that we are uh, collaborating again this year with Bay Area Women in Publishing uh, for a picnic here in the East Bay. So those of you who are local to the Bay Area, go to our website and you will see a link to sign up to be to participate in that. Um, and that'll be here in Berkeley on a Saturday, I believe. Anyway, that's it. I'm going to turn it over to fellow board member member Becky Morgan, who will introduce our speaker and get us going and talk about how we're going to be doing stuff today. Thank you all. Thanks, Dave, for uh, all the housekeeping. Um, I uh, am happy to introduce Ksenia Makarova, who I um, have been working with in a professional capacity for the past few years. Um, and I'm very impressed with her um, both her uh, design skills, which are unimpeachable, and also just her general um, um, sang froid and uh, ability to really uh, roll with all the changes and uh, change of direction or um, um, extra requests that come in. And so I'm, I'm, I think that she's going to really be a great resource here today. Um, so what we're going to be talking about is um, is designing elements for both when the, when um, you need both a print and digital components. Um, many publishers have gone digital first, uh, by which they mean um, that you're intended to interact with them their content primarily in a digital way. But there are always print elements, both um, print um, print main content in printed form for people who would like that in addition to or instead of digital content and things like business cards, catalogs, um, uh, trade show handouts, things like that. Uh, so you want them all to look like they represent the same entity, which, um, you know, which takes skill and care and design chops, all of which Xenia has. So I'm going to turn it over to her. Uh, and I want to uh, let you know also that um, uh, we're going to um, have Q&A. Xenia is going to speak for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to have Q&A at the end. Um, so please put your questions in the chat if you have them 
throughout her presentation. And then during the Q&A, you can either put your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand and we will call on you. Okay, take it away, Ksenia. Perfect. Thank Here we go. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the Publishing Professionals Network for having me today, uh, Becky and Dave, for getting this set up. And thank you to all of our attendees. Uh, I'm really excited to be sharing with you today. And hopefully I've got something helpful, or at the very least, interesting uh, within my slides here for you today. So we'll be talking about Unity in Design um, across multiple platforms or various design pieces, as Becky mentioned. Before we dive into that, I want to give you a little bit of, of background about myself. Uh, so I'm Ksenia Makarova. I'm a designer, art director, artist, and educator. I'm based in San Francisco. Um, I'm basically a Bay Area native. I moved here from Russia when I was young. And uh, I'm a graduate of the from the California College of the Arts, where I'm also a senior adjunct of graphic design. And uh, yeah, and I also do a little bit of fine art practice, as you can see here, a little mural snippet. Um, so before I dive into our main topic, a little bit of background on my design life. Um, who am I? What have I done? Why should you listen to me? Uh, so specifically, um, I want to say I'm really excited to be talking to a group of publishing professionals, because much of the first half of my career uh, was actually spent uh, in book design. So this is an example of the kind of uh, more art book fine press work I got to do. Uh, this is a collection of modern American koans with accompanying illustrations by Michael Wenger. Um, and these kinds of projects really allowed me to hone my design eye from a typographic sense and also just took a great deal of precision um, and were just really uh, exuberant, um, great places to kind of start my design life. Um, here is another example. This is a limited edition chapbook of poetry for Jane Hirschfield. Uh, so many of these early projects were really kind of a designer's dream. Um, this example here is four color letterpress with a hand done binding, as you can see in the top right. Um, with a uh, innovative uh, folding format and really kind of expressive illustration. So I got to do a lot of this really fine, um, exciting work at the beginning of my career. But at the same time, I was doing also a lot of really practical design, uh, specifically in the textbook world. So I designed a ton of college textbooks early on. Uh, these are some cover designs, but I was also creating the interior templates. And so as you can imagine, Imagine for a textbook, uh, you could have something like 70, 80 different textiles that would all have to work together with a lot of unity and consistency um, within a clear hierarchy. So really working in book design, I think, gave me a very strong design foundation and helped me to develop uh, many of the skills that I still use today. Uh, so all the books I just showed were created at Ingalls Design, uh, and I also worked at a number of uh, small but mighty local studios like uh, Melanie Doherty Design and Vanderbile Design with Michael Vanderbile uh, before moving into um, larger brand agencies, um, agencies uh, primarily uh, Pivot Design based in Chicago, uh, where I got to work at a very different scale. So I got to work on much larger national uh, marketing campaigns, ad campaigns, brand projects, like this example, this is a multi-million dollar uh, trade show pres presence for a pharmaceutical company called Baxalta, uh, which included upwards of 300 different pieces of design. And all of these had to work together. Uh, even though there was a large team of designers on this, we were all responsible for very many different pieces. And all of those had to work well within a system. So much of my background um, relates to what we're talking about today. And these two different experiences that I had from small studio to large agency uh, really made me uh, feel pretty confident in going off on my own. And so for the last uh, over five years now, I've been working in a solo capacity doing art, design, education, uh, but primarily uh, my the focus of my work is graphic design. 
and I'm lucky to work with a number of nonprofits. So this is one of my longstanding clients, the San Mateo County Libraries. Uh, I'll talk more about their brand system a little later, but we get to see a snippet of it here. I also work with a school district. These are logos that I've designed for the district as well as their individual schools. And I work with a number of state level nonprofits like the California Association of Public Hospitals here. Again, I'll talk more about this system uh, shortly. But point being that across all these different types of design that I've gotten to do, uh, unity and consistency has always been a key goal as I'm sure um, we're all familiar with. That's something that no matter what you're trying to design, you're always aiming to have. Um, consistency allows us, I mean, first off, right, it just makes things look orderly, put together um, and good. Uh, but beyond that, uh, unity and consistency uh, helps create uh, more memorability and recognition for your materials, right? So if a viewer sees two different pieces of your design in different contexts, if there's a lot of design unity between those two things, you're creating a much stronger memory chain in their mind and helping with brand recognition. Uh, from the designer's perspective, uh, consistency also just makes for a much smoother workflow. Uh, if we're having to reinvent the wheel every single time we design something, it's much more difficult than if we have a set of rules and ideas that we're following for each piece of design. And so now let's dive into the specifics. So whenever we're trying to create unity, um, we're trying to think about the system, not each individual item, at least at the high level. Right. So I'm always aiming to maintain a hierarchy across all these different pieces that I'm working with and to match the use of elements from one piece to another. Here is an example of that uh, with one of my clients, the Public Policy Institute of California. Uh, they recently, a couple of years back, had a website update. Um, where the web team made a lot of really great changes uh, that were affected the rest of the brand in terms of adding uh, some typographic styles, uh, adjusting the use of color and the approach to photography to get us to a really contemporary, clean, authoritative, yet welcoming feeling web presence. And you can see a few snippets of that here. Uh, it was then my task to take those changes and apply them to the full suite of print publications, of which we see three examples here. Um, and so, as I mentioned at the top of this point, uh, at the highest level, what I'm doing is I'm looking at what has already been done in the first piece, which essentially in this case is the website. And I'm trying to apply those same elements in the same way in the print pieces. So one thing we can see is that the serif font on the website is only being used uh, very sparingly for high level headings. And so in my print pieces, you can see I'm doing the exact same thing. If we look at color, right, the orange is only being used as a minor accent on the website. So I'm doing the same thing in the print pieces. Uh, similarly, the light gray gets used to create containers to separate different pieces of content. And so once again, whatever is happening in one piece, I'm trying to apply that across all of the different pieces in the system. To help me do that, I try as much as possible to work not on one piece like from beginning to end, but to be working on all the pieces roughly at the same time. So I'll get a rough layout going for one piece, do that for all of them, and then go back and forth and apply the same styles from one piece to another and the same ideas as much as possible. Uh, here are some folders from that same publication suite. And so the bright color with the photo, these are the outsides. And then in the background here, we can see the inside of the pocket folder. And so in this case, uh, we wanted to create a stronger impact, something bright and inviting from the outside of the piece. But once you open the folder, we wanted to maintain the same types of visual ideas as you see here in the print piece, in the website, where it's really light bright and the white and the pale gray are the primary things that we're seeing. So kind of at a very basic level, whatever you're doing in one piece of design, as much as possible, try to maintain that same hierarchy across all your pieces. 
Um, color is a really important element for maintaining consistency and a unified impression. Uh, our brains really like color, right? When we're subconsciously first approaching an object, we quickly scan it and color is one of the first things that we perceive. So whenever you can create a really strong and unified color palette, that will work to your advantage. Uh, here is the San Mateo County Libraries brand I mentioned earlier on. And here you'll see that this brand really leads with color. Uh, this rich blue is the primary brand color, but it's supported by three others, a teal, an orange, and a green, which can all be used together or individually to create a really bright, welcoming, friendly personality. Um, because this is a public library system with 13 branches, there are endless pieces of design that are not always being created by uh, me. There is an interior design team and then all the librarians uh, create various materials for their individual branches. So this system had to be really robust, but also easy to use. And so with this color palette, um, uh, here you can just kind of see that not only do we have print and uh, digital assets, we also have physical assets. So we've got the uh, bookmobile bus in the background, we have apparel, there are machines in each branch that get branding, we've got book bikes, so our color system really has to work flexibly across a lot of different uh, materials. And so in order for that to happen, um, in your brand style guide or your brand guidelines, as they might be called, you always have the exact breakdowns for each of your colors. And you have that in print, so that's Pantone or CMYK, and web values, that's RGB and hexadecimal. Um, aside from having the color values listed in your brand guidelines, um, generally it's great practice to save out uh, ASC color palette file. So that's an Adobe Creative Suite specific color palette file. So anyone using these colors can just load those swatches right into the uh, Creative Cloud Suite. Um, this is a screenshot from the brand style guide. Here is another page. Uh, not all style guides do this, but I really think they should. Aside from listing the exact uh, values of the colors, I always include color usage guidelines. So for this specific brand, uh, we break down the idea that primarily these colors are used individually. So a design piece might have lots and lots of blue and a little bit of white, lots of teal, a little bit of white. But if you are using all four colors in a piece, the blue should be the primary color with a fair amount of white space, and you can use the other colors for accents. Uh, we also, in this brand, uh, do a color overlay for photography. And so again, that is broken out in great detail in terms of how a different designer or one of the librarians might apply that in their files. So being really specific about color usage is a great place to start. Um, some other thoughts around color, uh, you definitely want to prioritize. Uh, if you're working with a suite of items that is digital or print first, I would say find the color that works best in that realm. So we'll see a brand later on that is digital first, where one of our colors just never really translates to print the same way as it does on screen. But we've decided that's okay, because digital is the space that we really want this brand to live in primarily and to shine there. Um, it might be that both print and digital are important for the system that you're working with. In that case, um, from the get-go, you can really think about what colors you're picking. Not all colors are as easy or difficult to match from screen to print as other colors. So warm colors, yellow, orange, red, generally no problem. Uh, dark blues, kind of your basic greens, not that bad. Anything that has kind of an electric quality on screen, anything bordering neon pastel, much harder to match in print, sometimes impossible. And purples, oddly enough, very difficult color to deal with. So if you can kind of keep those things in mind as you're starting to pick your color palette, you can uh, gain some advantages there. Uh, the Pantone system, obviously this is uh, historically how we match color in design. Um, today, Pantone is more or less relevant. If you're going to be doing a lot of print, absolutely you want to have uh, Pantone values. If your system lives primarily digitally, that might not be the place to start. You might actually want to start by finding the hexadecimal code that you want to work with and should Pantone become relevant, then matching a swatch there. Um, at the bottom, I mentioned that 
part of the reason for this is because Pantone swatches are no longer natively built into Adobe Creative Cloud as of the last update. Um, this is a travesty in my opinion, um, but it's not Adobe's fault. This is because of Pantone. Um, they have a new licensing format for this. Um, I imagine this might change, but for now they've kind of created a bit of a rift um, for using Pantone colors natively in the uh, Adobe Creative Cloud. Um, that said, uh, Adobe programs themselves do pretty good color conversions. So on the bottom right, I have a screenshot of a color window that you would see in Illustrator, Photoshop, or InDesign. And if you put a value in there, whether it's hexadecimal or RGB, and then you switch the view to CMYK or vice versa, you're going to get actually a pretty decent conversion. So that's not a bad place to start. Um, but nothing beats looking and testing. My second to the last point there. Um, really, whenever I'm picking colors as much as possible, I'm first off working on a color calibrated screen, but then I'm going to look at those colors on a bunch of different devices, many different screens. And if we're doing any printing, I'll have the printer run tests. I'll go on a press check if possible. I'll, if we're talking about desktop printing, I'll also do tests on multiple printers. Um, with color, you really can't be looking and making those adjustments as ne necessary. So that is color. Um, but then, of course, uh, typography is super important in publishing and a key element uh, if we're talking about unity and consistency. So some considerations on that. Uh, first off, simplify, right? The more fonts or typefaces you're working with in a piece, the more variation you're going to have when you're applying that same system to a different piece. So can you create the effect that you want with one font or maybe two. Um, if you can, it'll definitely be easier, especially for other designers, to recreate that same feeling that you got from the one piece in another piece. So as an example, uh, this is my recent rebrand for the California Association of Public Hospitals and Health Systems. Um, and this is a system with a number of items. It is uh, mostly digital first. And we use one font for everything. Uh, that font is a Google font called Railway. And whether it's the web or print pieces, as we see here, um, I'm using this exact same typeface, but in different weights and with scale and color change to create hierarchy. Uh, here's a screenshot, a page from the brand guidelines, where you can see that I've picked Railway because it has a really nice variety of weights from the super bold to the light. We can get a lot of flexibility just by using this one typeface. And much like with color, I always like to include usage guidelines uh, in the brand style guides. Uh, I also like to do that for typography uh, with more or less detail. This is like the very basic level where uh, the brand guidelines just include one page that have a type hierarchy sample uh, where I'm showing like if we've got one big headline, we use really large shifts of scale uh, to make it stand out from the other content. Uh, other guidance uh, things like uh, we only use small caps very sparingly for subheads. And then if we're using one of the lighter colors as an accent, we only use the light blue for accessibility reasons, uh, and we use it consistently for all the pieces in this system. So that's one idea for typography is simplifying. Um, another thing to think about is licensing. Um, I'll jump over to the websites uh, for both of these next points um, at the end. Uh, but basically, uh, most of us at this point are using Adobe fonts. Adobe fonts uh, work natively with the Adobe Creative Cloud. They're really easy to activate. There's a lot of different options. Now, if you have a web project, you can very easily um, use any Adobe font for your web project. The problem is, if you do it through Adobe fonts, that website is now forever linked in that way with your Adobe uh, Creative Cloud account. So let's say my client needs a font applied to their website and I do it through my Creative Cloud account. If I ever cancel that account, 
the font goes away from the website. And that's pretty problematic, right? Um, similarly, Adobe Fonts has been known to break contracts with foundries where there used to be fonts there that no longer are. Um, and so the best thing to do, if you have an Adobe font you wanna use for a web project, uh, within Adobe Fonts, I'll show you guys in a sec, you can um, find the foundry that made that font and you can buy a separate web license from them. And that is a much more consistent way to apply uh, that font to a web project. Um, but that said, I really like Google Fonts. For all of my nonprofit clients, I try to find Google Fonts that will work for them because they are free for all use, web and print with easy to apply open licenses. And so finally, uh, my last thought is that in order to create consistency, obviously we're applying a lot of rules and trying to use a lot of elements in the same way, but I think it's also really important to embrace flexibility and really think about the context of each individual piece within a system. And so what we wanna do is focus on creating a consistent impression rather than recreating the exact same relationship of elements in all materials. So going back to this uh, CAPH brand, um, it's actually two separate brands that have to work together. They have a sister agency called uh, the California Healthcare Safety Net Institute. Uh, and so both of these logos are anchored by a custom letter form. As you can see, the C and the S uh, made up of shapes that represent growth, connectivity, and openness. And I then used those same shapes to create two brand patterns, which we can see bottom right. Um, and so when we use the brand patterns in print, as you see in these business cards and in these print pieces, we show a lot of the pattern, right? There's a lot of detail going on. And that works well in print to create digital, uh, to create visual interest. But when we got into building the website, we found that using those patterns in the same way gets incredibly busy on screen. Um, all of those small negative spaces, all the white space in between all these shapes is really active and it's a little distracting from the primary content, the photography and the text. So for the website, I zoomed in on those same pieces and we use them as these larger supporting shapes. And so even though we're not using these elements in the exact same way, the overall impression is clearly that all of these pieces belong to the same entity. And furthermore, um, every year I do a conference theme for these brands. And with that, I like to take a piece of the brand and create a totally different graphic. So the graphics that we see on the left really are outside of what we usually do within the brand, but they express the uh, conference theme, which is stronger together this year and they still follow a lot of the other rules of the system. So I'm following the rules, but I'm using a little bit of flexibility to create visual interest. And again, to create the same impression, even when all the elements are not exactly the same. And kind of on the whole, my big takeaway is that you know, with design, it's very logical. We want it to be very precise. We want there to kind of be formulas for getting everything to look perfect across the board, but it's not math, right? There's still a fair degree of artistry and creativity involved. Um, and so with my students, especially, I always highlight the importance of looking at a lot of good designs, looking at a lot of successful design systems and using that to help you develop the eye for that feeling of consistency. Because so much of it is really just about moving things around on the page until they feel right, or at least, you know, until it clicks. Um, so hopefully there are some helpful thoughts for you there. And uh, really quickly, I just wanted to jump to the uh, Adobe font site, just so I could really quickly um, point out that idea around uh, font licensing. One moment. So yes, I mentioned Adobe fonts. So it's this great resource where you have a whole lot of different fonts, but for web licensing, so my recommendation is whatever font you're finding that you like, right under the name here, it'll say who makes it. And then you can go to their individual website and just buy a specific web license for that font. And then the other site I'd mentioned was Google Fonts. 
uh, their collection of fonts is a little bit more limited, but they're adding things all the time. And these are free, easy to use across the board. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. That was really great. A uh, really great mix of the um, general and the specific. Um, so uh, we're going to do some Q&A now. I'm going to start with some questions that uh, people put in the chat um, throughout the presentation, and then um, we'll give a chance for people to raise their hands and uh, ask questions here in the Zoom room. Um, so the first question is from John Berry from Seattle. A uh, practical question about line length in text from one medium to another. Um, I found that shorter, shorter lines seem consistently more readable on screen than in print. What do you think about line length? Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. I, I think great point, like line length in general is such an important consideration. Um, yes, generally on screen, especially if we're thinking about mobile, which is a really tight vertical format, shorter line length is better. Obviously with web projects, mobile projects, sometimes you can control line length, sometimes you can't, right? And mostly you don't have as much control because people are going to be increasing, decreasing size on their end. Um, so just kind of accepting a lot more flexibility with it from web web and mobile projects. Um, but as a general rule, yes, I think that's a great point. Shorter line length for screen is great. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Felgar um, has a question about accessibility, um, specifically um, in color. Uh, some readers have color vision limitations, such as difficulty discerning the difference between red and green or access accessibility in terms of how to recreate complex interior book designs in a reflowable pub. So how do you deal with people's accessibility um, issues? Yes, um, this is a whole other branch of design that I think is getting more and more attention, um, which is wonderful. Uh, InDesign has a pretty robust suite of accessibility controls. Um, so I have uh, organizations I work with where I actually am producing uh, fully accessibility compliant documents out of InDesign. Uh, that means things like adapting your document for screen reading. Uh, there's making sure that there's alt text for all images. Uh, there's a lot of very specific considerations. Uh, it's uh, WCAG, I think we're on 3.0, 2.0. Um, but basically, if you're interested in that, there's um, a lot of great resources around uh, how to make sure that you're creating uh, accessibility compliant documents. And InDesign now has a lot of tools for that. Uh, specifically for color, um, that's something I really rely on a lot of uh, web tools for. I literally just go to Google and go accessibility color checker, uh, and that allows you to plug in um, colors for like my text is this color, the background is this color, and it'll tell you whether that is uh, an acceptable uh, color combination uh, for accessibility considerations. Thank you. Um, Dave? would uh, like to know if you recommend any color palette development apps or plugins? Oh, that's a great question. Um, there are a lot of resources available in that realm. Um, I, coming from fine art, I really love just messing with color, working with color on my own. Um, so I don't have a lot of those off the top of my head. I know Adobe actually has their own tool, um, Adobe Color. Uh, that's an online tool that's uh, pretty cool. You can um, kind of choose one color and it'll make uh, like different color palettes for you, or you can browse other people's color palettes. But I'm sure there are a lot of um, other tools as well. Maybe uh, if any attendees know of any, they can drop those in the chat. Um, John Berry is asking, what about variable fonts? Variable fonts, super cool. Um, I don't know if everyone's familiar with variable fonts, but it's basically a, a typeface where you um, install one typeface rather than multiple cuts of it. And then within your uh, programs you're working with those fonts in, you'll have sliders for adjusting things like lightness, weight, width, et cetera. Um, I'm a fan of variable, variable fonts. I have not yet used one in a web project. I think it might have different considerations there, um, but that's not something I can specifically speak to. I don't know if I covered, if there's like a specific question around variable fonts, I can speak to that more. 
John, do you want to, is that, is that good? Do you want, does that answer your question? Uh, you're still muted. Can you unmute yourself? No, oh, are you good? Uh, so I see one question says, uh, have you learned anything in your mural design practice that you've applied to your graphic design practice? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I really think that all of my work influences the rest of my work. Uh, if you look at my fine artwork and my murals, they're very designerly. I use a lot of flat, bold shapes and uh, simple color palettes and things like that. Um, I think the more I do fine artwork and focus on murals and things, the more adventurous some of my other designs become. So I try to work more of my um, graphics and, and diverse kind of visual styles into more of my client work. Um, and that's been really exciting. Um, I would say if anything, I probably, uh, my graphic design skills really help me a lot in mural world, but I can't necessarily think of anything specific that goes the other way, but thank you. <laughs> Uh, Doug has an interesting question that I know that we all struggle with, and this isn't just about unity and design, but this has to do with when clients, when you're talking about color and clients who might have different monitors, right, that have, are displaying color differently. Um, and have you ever gotten into a situation where you create a color palette and then you discover that the client actually isn't necessarily seeing the same thing that you are? As opposed to the old world of print only, where you know you had a Pantone swatch book, you could guarantee that you're all looking at the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I all the time, right? I think even if you take uh, monitors and screens out of the equation, I'm constantly having conversations with clients or like even my partner, who's also an artist and designer, about we don't see color the same way. I'm like, this is a bluey green. And he's like, it's a greeny blue, right? Um, so I think just at a base level, that's important to recognize. We all see color differently, legitimately, we do. Um, and then in the modern world too, it used to at least be that color when it lived on screen, mostly lived on professional screens that might be color calibrated. Whereas color now lives in everyone's pocket on a screen and those screens will never show it the same way. So for me, I really think it's just kind of letting go a little bit and just accepting a degree of variability. Um, I think in general, right, design more and more, um, it's less about, you know, putting everything into this perfect order and getting it to stay there and more about creating systems that can be flexible and can still work even if it's not the exact same thing yeah i have a a, a question um around um i guess you know a given project if you are working on something and you're following this path with typefaces and color palettes and then at some point have you ever just realized I'm going down the wrong rabbit hole. This is just not working and you kind of have to abandon that. Or do you feel like at this point, you're pretty good about, um, you know, letting things go quickly. I, I think it has to do with that time investment component where you put a certain amount of time into a project and then you realize like, this is not working with the client's materials. It's a great question. Oh, that just makes me feel nervous just thinking about it, right? Um, I think uh, I have a pretty strong workflow in which I always start very broad. So no matter what I'm working on, I'm presenting uh, at least two, usually three to four directions to a client um, in the initial stages and always making sure that those directions are very different. Um, I'm also, as I mentioned, always trying to work on a few components. So I know that whatever system I'm putting in place is gonna work across everything we do. Um, that said, uh, sometimes things happen. Like very recently, uh, the reason I was talking about the Adobe web, web font licensing situation is that I had gotten very far on a project where I had picked fonts, colors, we had designed a lot of this thing. And then my developer, pointed out the issue with the Adobe font. I had picked all Adobe fonts. Um, and there was one serif in there that there's there was no good Google font that we could match it to. Um, and so, and we couldn't hang it on my Creative Cloud account. We we're really wanting to switch it to Google fonts. And so in that case, I had to swap out this serif, which I thought was like a drastic change. We went from like a florid humanist serif to something very modernist and tight. The client did not notice. 
<laughs> right? So first off, there's things like that, where as designers, we have certain things that we think are really obvious and really important that might actually not be on the other end. Um, the scenario where like I was going in one direction and then I realized this just isn't working, luckily hasn't happened to me too often. But one thing that I'm really big on is, is clear communication with clients, you know? And so if I were to run into that scenario, I would very quickly explain to my client what was happening and immediately offer a solution. That's my thing. I don't, I never just bring problems to the table. If, if I see a problem, I show up with solutions. Um, and so I would say, you know, hey, we're going in this direction. Here's why it's not working. Here is what I think we should do now instead. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's it for the questions in the chat. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has anything that they want to add at the last minute. Um, if you do come up with a question and you just haven't thought about it um, yet, but you think about it uh, in the next couple of days, feel free to email, email us at operations at pubpronetwork.org. I will put that in the chat. Uh, and what we'll try to do is actually include it. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll include the response in the email that's going out. So we'll be sending out an email to um, to everyone who signed up through Eventbrite to let them know one, uh, where the link uh, uh, to the video once we get it uploaded and uh, also um, just any of the resources that we put in the chat because the chat will not be showing up in the video. Uh, um, looks like uh, Doug, uh, excuse me, Joe's got a question. You are muted. There we go. I would, uh, they wouldn't let me unmute. I was reading that. Um, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, it was so so fascinating. My question early on, you were talking about the project where you know they did the online version, and then it fell to you to convert that to print. I'm curious. In those situations, do they involve you in the online process too, as like a kind of, or do, at what point do you come into that, and do they solicit your feedback on the print side and how that might impact? Yeah, um, that completely depends um, client, <clears throat> client to client, project to project. Uh, in this case, I did get to give some feedback um, on the later stages of the web design. That is really the fact that I'm not more involved in the web project is really my fault, choice, what have you. Um, I comfortably have managed to stay kind of somewhat out of the web design world. Like I work with developers to design web pages or create web products, but I still manage to do a ton of work that is um, either print first or it's digital first, but we're not designing websites, what have you. Um, and in this case too, this was a really, uh, a fairly massive web design. Um, and so the team that was handling that um, had really great uh, controls over what was happening there. And I was happy to just apply those ideas um, to the print pieces. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and especially thank you so much. This has been a great session. This is our first time that we've tried doing this at noon. Um, it's kind of an experiment to see if more folks from the East Coast um, can join in present rather than just watching in a video if it's in the early evening or late evening on the East Coast. So um, if you um, like it, let us know because we'll try to do more of these. Thank you all for coming and um, thanks. I think this was an amazing session and so helpful. Thank you so, so much. Thank you all so much. It's been so fun. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.